How often have you heard of a dual engine out in a modern biz jet? So stick with us on Flyware as we look at the one that didn't turn out well at all. And I think you're going to find that this one is a bit harder than you might think. Not straightforward. <music> Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today we're going to look at the crash of a Bombardier 700 Global Express that was destroyed during a forced landing attempt in a field in Ghazani province, Afghanistan. Something uh, must have gone seriously wrong, and I know you're thinking, just what is a really big biz jet doing in Afghanistan in the first place? Well, the answer to that is simple, and no, it's not some sort of rendition conspiracy theory. It serves as an off-the-shelf battlefield airborne communications node. Okay, so what the heck is that anyway? Well, you know it's got to be Air Force with that kind of uh, name, uh, Bacon, is <laughs> the short version of what they call that uh, airplane. So remember that Afghanistan is very mountainous and has virtually no infrastructure. The E-11A serves as the voice, data, video, relay platform for allied units across the whole battlefield. I guess you can call it a Wi-Fi or internet in the sky. It's a range extender, especially for short-range radios. The Air Force, want, Air Force keeps one airborne pretty much 24-7 over that country, and not many jets have the kind of endurance or volume for all that equipment and fuel. Loiter time is important. So the cheapest option was to buy a currently produced aircraft that met the needs of the mission. And there were only four of these airplanes in inventory at the time, and... A few weeks ago, the Air Force actually moved to buy six more, and I think that means that uh, it turns out they're a pretty valuable tool, and they're probably going to be used elsewhere around the world. Um, for the accident flight, the pilot in command was on short duty. He was uh, temporary duty, TDY is what we call it, from a stateside unit to uh, the squadron here to fly. He was experienced in the airplane, had over a 1,000 hours in it, and he was an instructor pilot. Co-pilot was also from a different unit stateside and was on his third sortie in the airplane. The Air Force has no E-11As stateside for training, and so this was the co-pilot's third time in a real airplane. So one quick note about training. For this type of airplane, it is re it's regularly flown around the world, and it has normal training programs like others of its class. This means that new pilots undergo ground and simulator training and then do their check rides and receive their type rating, et cetera, for the airplane in the simulator before they ever touch a real airplane, okay? And frankly, this is the same training regimen for the airlines you use. It's what I went through in the airline I flew for. You first fly the airplane with people on board as a trainee for a period of time. And this type of training program that's a fire hose is not for low time pilots. So the end game, was that the uh, airplane appears to have attempted a forced landing, uh, the crew attempted a forced landing in a field 70 miles southwest of Kabul. This is Taliban territory, enemy territory, and the crew of two did not survive it. So let's unpack what actually happened in this accident. 358 is the airplane in question, and it was assigned to support this ongoing combat mission in Afghanistan, supporting allied and Afghan security forces. The pilot served as aircraft commander and the instructor for the co-pilot's third upgrade ride. Planning for the mission and pre-flight were normal, and takeoff and climb to altitude were accomplished via VFR. Uh, the airborne traffic profile is a lot different in the AOR than the kind of flying we do here in, this, in the U.S. or other, other places in the world. The combat area, also known as the A. Area of Operations, also known as AOR for short. Um, they're, and they're controllers uh, that supervise the AOR in much the same way as normal airspace. Uh, but in a nutshell, their job is a bit different. It's to deconflict traffic and then help prosecute bad guys whether in the air or on the ground. It gets a bit more complicated and people are shooting at the, at the air, airplanes that are flying through the airspace. The accident crew initially flew in orbit at about 42,000 feet. After an hour and 45 minutes, they requested a climb to 43,000, and the crew initiated that climb on autopilot and pushed the throttles up. After the airplane had climbed to about 3,000, uh, sorry, climbed to about 300 feet, 
a fan blade separated from the first stage of the left engine. This fan blade caused major damage and a component of the full authority digital engine controller, or FADEC, shut the engine down. Simultaneously, the cockpit voice recorder, or CVR, recorded the bang, and then it stopped recording. This is unfortunate because the crew's comments and uh, their working of the problem are subsequently lost to history. It's a real shame. So stick with me. This is going to be a bit of a fast ride, okay, as we go through this accident. The loss of the CVR is a major problem in accurately determined determining what happened and when it occurred. The, the investigative team examined another Global Express that had experienced an identical engine failure in 2006. And this was pretty valuable in uh, trying to figure out what happened here. The pilot on that incident reported that following the blade separation, the airframe vibrations were so bad that the crew wondered if there had actually been a mid-air collision with another airplane. In other words, they didn't think it was an engine problem at first at all. He described a loud bang and sustained intense vibration throughout the rest of the flight. Significantly, the pilot reported that he could not determine which engine had failed without looking at the instruments. And this is a critical point without studying them. Okay, the digital flight data recorder, DFDR, that's the data black box, was found, also found and it did record the event. The data showed that initially the nose of the aircraft yawed left and then rapidly right when the throttle was moved up and back again. And uh, the data also showed vibrations were 25% greater than the previous Global Express incident with the uh, fan blade departure. I can imagine that the stress levels were pretty high in that cockpit right about now. So the auto throttles disengaged automatically, but the autopilot remained engaged. 10 seconds after the event, the crew retarded both throttles to just above idle, then advanced the, the left throttle just over midway for one second and then retarded it to match the right engine. Immediately, the left engine was put, then pushed up to three quarters power and the right engine brought to idle. Nine seconds later, the right engine switch was placed in off. This shut down the right engine. Fuel, hydraulics, uh, electric, all that kind of stuff. At that point, the left throttle was advanced to full power and then to idle. For uh, four seconds later, both throttles were then pushed up to full power together. Sounds confusing? Quick time out here for a second, okay? For big airplanes, for big jet airplanes, it's common to pra practice to marry the throttles after shutting one down. The idea is to make movements and tasks as much like normal as possible. I don't know if this is a standard procedure for the Global Express, but in the Air Force, this practice of marrying the throttles would have saved a C-5 crash about 20 years ago, and it has become a, kind of a semi-important uh, crew procedure. It was also at the airline I flew for. Uh, one would presume that the throttle movements were split and varied to determine which engine was the bad engine. The big problem here is that the movements were way too fast. Pausing for a second, uh, it's just way too fast. The DFDR did record vib vibrations varying with the throttle, but the vibrations themselves were variable in intensity and irregular in time. Kind of erratic, hard to figure out. It's pretty hard to perceive that in such a short time that you can figure out what the differences are. One thing the crew presumably missed was that the engine, engine instruments followed the throttle movements except for the left N1 or fan. This is the fan section of the engine that had shed the blade. This was a critical miss, but I can see it's a likely oversight when you're moving the throttle so quickly, you're banging them back and forth. Uh, the second sequence of throttle movements, coupled with shutting, the engine, shutting off the engine run switch, is consistent with the Global Express flight crew operations checklist for this. I think it's safe to say that they were following the checklist at this point. But the time elapsed to this point from the event to shutting that right down engine down was 24 seconds. That means the crew had spent less than, less than that, what, 20 seconds analyzing and deciding what action to take for the problem. I think that's kind of quick. Here the problem is a human factor, the startle response. 
Coupled with a sense of urgency from the severe vibration led the crew to rush through the checklist. We've got to fix this problem right now. The airplane's going to shake apart. This quick reaction painted the crew into a corner. And they're going to do another one here in a little bit. It gets a little bit worse. Uh, about eight seconds after the shutdown, uh, the right engine airframe vibration, the shutting down the right engine, airframe vibrations dropped noticeably. And this is a rather unfortunate coincidence and might have led the crew into accepting it as an indicator that they had shut the correct engine down. However, both engines continue to roll back and because the left is rolling back, it's probably why the airframe vibration has decreased. This is a graphic of the engine indication and crew alerting system, the ICAS, and it's displayed to the crew. It's how they monitor what's going on. Quick another, another quick timeout here. Most high bypass turbofans are operated by an EPER, exhaust pressure ratio, and what this means is that the crew is accustomed to looking at the top gauge, the EPER gauge, for performance settings. Not really looking at the others uh, in, in, uh, specifically. So what other indication did the crew have? Notice that the N1, that middle gauge, shows the left engine slightly higher than the right, and that matches all the way down to fuel flow. So just looking at this gauge is, you know, it seems to me that the left engine is running. Okay, that, that, that doesn't look like it's quit yet. So now look at the messages. The only amber warning light is left FADAC fail. Okay, um, in every Air Force jet I've flown that had an electric engine control, we call them EECs, uh, they, they reverted to a manual controller in case of a problem. You had to keep the airplane running. Not full envelope, but pretty close to it. That seems like a small issue, um, but it's not actually. The investigative team discovered that a majority of the E-11A pilots in the squadron understood this message to mean a failure of the software and not an indication that the engine had or will shut down. After all, Air Force airplanes have manual reversions, right? Trouble is, you, you gotta remember that this is an off-the-shelf civilian airplane. The checklist for left FADAC fail lists three possible consequences of this failure, one of which leads directly to an engine shutdown without crew intervention. Given the time between the start of the event and the shutdown of the right engine, it is unlikely that this checklist was referred to. And that is a critical event, if you will, in this accident chain, okay? This is a derived graphic of what the, ICAS, the ICAS system would have shown right after the right engine was shut down. Confusing. The alert is in white because it was a crew action. The left FADAC fail amber message is still on. What is interesting is that there is a red, it exists a red dual engine out warning message that will alert if an uh, amber engine flame out or a white engine shutdown message is displayed. This did not show when the crew shut the right engine down because the left engine FADAC had shut the engine down. So the criteria was not met at that time. When the left engine dropped below 35%, the amber left engine flame out light was displayed and then the red, in, red dual engine out message and all this other stuff was displayed. And that took about 45 seconds before it happened. And that's plenty of time to get comfortable with the actions that, that they had taken so far. It sounds like a bit like confirmation bias. Uh, when the uh, ICAS finally displayed what was happening, it went to this. And that's a whole laundry list of red and amber messages. What is the root problem? Okay. The only good message here is the blue rat gen on. This means that the ram air turbine, the rat, emergency generator had deployed into the windstream and the crew had emergency electrical and hydraulic power. You know, they, they, in other words, they could still fly the airplane even without the engines running. Okay, notice the engine instruments for the left engine. It is obviously not running, but some of the indications are not as expected. Notably, N1 is zero. It should never be zero in the air. Notice the right engine's about uh, just over 20% RPM. And that's off. No fuel flow. Uh, the crew notified Kabul air traffic controllers at that point that they had lost both engines and then 
then they did it again right before they impacted the ground, only twice. The DFDR records data that indicates the crew then ran the dual engine out checklist with some deviations. Importantly, the crew flew at a higher airspeed than Best Glide and did not start the APU, the auxiliary power unit, which is a separate turbine that provides a uh, turbine engine that provides more power than the RAT, as well as compressed air to start the engines with. It's usually what you do ground starts with. Um, it appears that the crew was initially focused on an air start, which required 258 knots of indicated speed to make the engines run. We did practice that in the airline, but it was not a primary way of starting an, an, an engine that had quit. To be fair, the checklist here directs an air start first. But to counter that, I'm going to say that the manufacturer probably envisioned this checklist was to be run before the airplane had lost much speed and altitude at cruise flight and cruise speed, so they're pretty close to that speed. At this point, we are several minutes into the event and descending rapidly. Moreover, they, they only attempted a restart on the left engine and never the right. The checklist directs that both engines be started. Significantly, the investigation revealed that the aircraft commander had previously expressed confidence that he could affect an air start if he ever encountered an engine loss. So that was his go-to plan from the very beginning. Glide time for this airplane from 30,000 feet, that's where the, in, the air start envelope started, would have been on the order of about 12 minutes. Given the ground track of the airplane and the speeds and descent rates, it was assessed that several air start attempts were tried during the descent profile. When the APU was started, several more attempts were tried and the DFDR, you know, the thing about it is the DFDR requires generator power from the engines to operate, and because there was never an air start, there's no DFDR data to definitively show the air start attempts and what happened during those attempts. But the airspeed and ground track are consistent with that air start profile. Okay, this is a really important graphic that really gives us a bird's eye view of what's happening. It's the relationship of the airplane and divert fields during the event. Remember, this started at 42,000 feet. The investigators determined that three to five minutes uh, after the event, the crew could have glided to and landed at either Bagram or Kabul airports. Basically, it's straight ahead, and they would have made it. There were divert fields available to the crew. There's even one behind them, about 28 miles. But apparently, they never considered any one of those. The intention of the crew was to return to Kandahar which was another 230 miles away from the crash site. Only after multiple start events were abandoned did they attempt to fly towards FOB Sharana, which is a uh, friendly location with no runway. Um, and not good weather either, it turns out. The aircraft impacted the ground 21 miles short of this friendly base, and the crew had extended flaps and slats with the gear up, which indicates that the crew was planning on making a forced landing. The weather in this accident area was about a thousand foot ceilings, and that frankly doesn't leave the crew much time to pick a landing spot when you pop out of the clouds at the descent rates they were flying. The train was largely flat, and that's in their, their benefit, but it was crisscrossed with berms and ditches three to six feet high. I don't see how they could have known that. And they ended up hitting a berm almost immediately and then skidded sideways to a halt in about a thousand feet. Pretty fast de deceleration. Shedded both wings and ignited the 16,000 pounds of fuel on board. Cockpit and tail remained upright, but the cockpit and the cabin were pretty much destroyed by fire. The A-10 and a pair of A-10s were dispatched to locate the crew in the airplane, and they actually found it, but weather prevented recovery until the next day. And during that recovery period, they uh, they re they recovered the crew and the recorders of the aircraft. I think they actually had to come back again for one of the other recorders. Then they destroyed the airplane in place. You're not going to pull that out of an enemy territory. So the wreckage was not available for the investigation team to refer to. Don't forget the hostile territory issue here. The, the folks there did take uh, photos of the airplane, and those photos sh plainly show the missing blade on the left engine with no other exterior damage, no apparent damage to the right engine other than the impact damage during the landing kind of important to the, uh, to the investigation. As a result of the deep dive in the DFDR data, they were able to determine that five seconds after the left fan blades separated, the N1 RPM decreased to 7.6%, 7 
and then spiked to 256% where it stayed for the rest of the flight. The separation caused the, caused the N1 turbofan to become unbalanced and it is designed to damage the associated speed probe, which is an interesting feature, I think. But this in turn gave unreliable speed data and that triggered the FADEC to in, in, initiate an automatic shutdown, which disengaged the auto throttles and displayed that amber and cyan message that we saw earlier in the graphic. Uh, any air start or APU start attempt on the left engine would be aborted by the FADEC from that point. Once it shut it down, it's not going to let it go. The in right engine run switch was never moved from off after the engine was shut down. So let's circle back to the event itself. It took 24 seconds for the crew to shut down the right engine after the catastrophic engine, uh, catastrophic failure of the left engine. In the previous Global Express event like this one, the crew took almost two minutes to determine the failed engine before shutting it down. And okay, the, I get it, really. The environment was severe, noise, vibration, uh, all very distracting. And, uh, and studies show that the startle effects can last from one and a half to 30 seconds and then significantly impact a pilot's response to an event. An event. And this leads directly to the old adage, you know, when an emergency happens, the first thing you do is wind your watch, okay? Don't do a knee-jerk reaction. That's where that comes from, basically, I think. The crew declared that they were gonna to return to Kandahar before they knew they had a dual engine flame out. And this evinced a confidence that an air start would be made, don't worry about it. A divert field was not considered, and this decision painted them into another corner that they were never gonna get out of. The crew did not fly best glide profile, until a relatively low altitude, squandering energy, any energy advantage they had from being at 42,000 feet. This is an error of prioritization. For the, early port, port, for the early portion of this accident, the ICAST indications were inconclusive as to which engine had actually failed. The amber left FADAC fail was a glaring indication that was not apparently addressed. When, I, when the ICAST finally indicated a red dual engine out, the crew did not reassess the engine instruments and note the frozen N1 on the left engine. Um, so the crew flew a, a windmill air start profile long enough to attempt many starts. Most of their altitude was lost trying to do this, but they never reassessed their conclusions. And this pro proved to be a fatal mistake. How did we get two engines fail? Was it something we did? Apparently that didn't happen. These pilots were suddenly thrust into an extremely violent, stressful situation, and not many of us GA pilots are gonna face a similar situation. Or will we? The main here issue here, in my view, is that the crew jumped to a conclusion with lightning speed. They made the wrong choice, had never accepted the indications that showed they had made the wrong choice. They never changed course. And this combined with the misprioritizations of actions, not going to a divert field, resulted in the crash. To me, there's a huge similarity between this portion of the crash and the B-17-909 incident, okay? What are the first things we do in our engine out plan? Well, we turn towards a suitable landing spot and trim for the best glide speed. Once you've done that, then you see if you can get the engine restarted. The crew bypassed two great diverts to pursue a false choice of flying back to home base. Don't assume you're gonna get your engines back. Fly the airplane first, navigate it towards a suitable landing uh, spot, and then communicate. And that kind of means running the checklist too. Uh, with the two crew airplanes, you can divide the workload, but it doesn't mean you can stop flying the plane. Whether we have one engine or two, make decisions with the energy you have right now. Don't bet on something you don't have. And I'll, I'm sure that both of these pilots were experienced and they were good pilots. They just hadn't thought any of these things through and they were surprised and they acted way too fast for that surprise thing. They didn't have the hair standing up on the back of their neck. Wow. I hope you liked the video and can recognize that big airplanes are small. They often all have to follow the same rules. If you like it, please, please hit subscribe. It looks a bit like this. And uh, the bell gives you notifications of the next video. Liking it helps me with the YouTube uh, algorithm and uh, all that's great. <laughs> I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters there here, 
they help me put these videos together. And if you'd like to support the channel and join us for a chat sometime or something like that, I'm going to leave a link below. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flower. Click this link for the latest upload. Click this link for whatever YouTube thinks you ought to watch. Or you can click this link to subscribe. Thanks for watching.